All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to those uh, joining in right now. Uh, in just a couple minutes, we're going to be starting our demonstration on blacksmithing, but I just wanted to show you guys a little bit where we're at today. So today we're coming to you live from the Petaluma Adobe State Historic Park. Um, and it is located in the town of Petaluma in California here. So if you don't know where Petaluma is, uh, we are about mm, 45 minutes north of San Francisco in Sonoma County. So I'll be explaining in a little bit more about this great historic site to you as we're watching. There's Doug over there, our demonstration <laughs> um, on blacksmithing. I just want to give you guys this cool old adobe building that we're at and we're just waiting. Okay, so we're like already hitting 12 o'clock. So we're just gonna go ahead and let me introduce myself. So hello everyone, my name's Emily. I am a guide with California State Parks and I'm gonna be your moderator today on this great uh, demonstration, Forge with Fire Blacksmithing at the Petaluma Adobe. And for those of you who are just joining us, yes, I'm coming to you live from the Petaluma Adobe State Historic Park today. We're just about 45 minutes north of San Francisco for those of you who don't know where that is. And today we are going to be working with one of our own blacksmiths who are at the park. Well, that's not really his title, um, but we have Doug Johnson uh, doing blacksmithing for us today. Now, Doug is a 20 year employee here at State Parks. He actually started as a park maintenance aide down in Santa Cruz doing trail crews. And then he worked his way up. He's worked at seven different parks. If you've been to Columbia State Historic Park before, you probably have seen some of Doug's work because he was a restoration specialist there. So restoration specialists, they're the ones that are gonna make sure that all those buildings look authentic to the time period, any maintenance that needs to be done on them. He's done that work before. And in Sonoma here, we were really lucky to get him up here. He's now our uh, parks maintenance chief up here, but he still does that restoration specialist while running a whole maintenance crew. And something that he added into his repertoire is blacksmithing. So let me introduce you guys to Doug Johnson. Hi, Doug. How are you? How are you today? I am doing fantastic. Good. So I'm actually just going to come a little bit over here. So I'm a little bit out of the head. So explain to us, Doug, what you are going to be working on today. What we're going to have is we're going to take a flat piece of steel and make a strut hinge that we would probably use on something like a barn door. Oh, we okay. Chisel cut and then we will punch holes in it for the bolts to go through. And the fasteners you might use would be a lag bolt. An older one would have a square head mm -hmm. and that would be the round hole and you will punch it out to the size so this fits through and it's, you can screw it to the wall. And then you have a carriage bolt which has a little square shoulder on it and you use a square punch so that you can drive that through that hole and it will actually sit in there and not turn when you put the nut on the other side. And these are both very old styles of fast. Well, that's really cool. So what have you done to prepare for your demonstration today? I built this strap in to show you what I'm building. And then we took this was one piece of steel, this strap hinge, and this piece here was all one piece of steel when we started. And I did do a little bit of pre-work because it takes a long time to drive, <laughs> get better hold on to drive a chisel through there and cut this piece of material. So and that's what we're gonna be doing right now. And I'm gonna break these coals over and get this nice and hot. And we're going to take a chisel and we're going to cut this, separate it, and then we'll start bending these around a little metal pin. Hard to pick up with my gloves. <laughs> it's okay. Very little metal cool. pin that becomes the hinge. Awesome. That looks really great. So, 
So your first thing you're gonna do is heat up that metal a little first bit. First thing we're gonna do is get this metal all nice and glowing red hot. So this is actually a coal forge that you're using. You actually use actual coal. Actual bitumous coal. Bitumous coal to get it going. And this is a hand crank. It pumps air to it. And as you watch, you will see the temperature go. That's pretty intense. So what inspired you to become a blacksmith? I mean, when was the first time you ever actually tried blacksmithing? I was, uh, I was a young boy in Columbia and our family friends owned the concession that was the blacksmith shop. So I was lucky enough as a young boy of 10 to go in and have family friends help us out and let show me things in the blacksmith shop. And I actually had a uh, part-time job in, a, in the summer, stamping names in horseshoes for visitors. That is so lucky. So kids at home, you know, just so you guys know, don't be uh, trying this at home without adult supervision. This is something that you learn, but Doug was really lucky to, to have someone that he knew that was doing it to what we would be calling apprenticing or actually learning from how to do that. So let's move a little closer to see what Doug's doing over here. This is a very traditional way of cutting metal. It's called a chisel cut. And it's almost, I'm gonna go for another feed. Changes a little bit when you've moved your tools around. Um, when, you, when you set up, usually you will have a blacksmith shop that all of your tools are all in the same spot. And everything you reach for is in the same place. So when we set up out here in a different configuration, it actually, actually takes a little bit of extra effort. <laughs> exactly. Yes, as some of you can see, we are here live um, at the Petaluma Adobe. Just so you guys all know, the Petaluma Adobe is actually still currently uh, closed. So we are the only people up here today. We normally wouldn't be doing it like right here. Uh, we probably do a little bit off to the side or have protections up for visitors, but we're the only two here. Also one of the reasons we are doing COVID safety, we're six feet apart, we're outside. So that's why uh, Doug is okay not to wear masks. Plus with hot fire, we don't want him to actually have any issues. There we go. So we heated that piece of metal up. Now he's gonna. Just keep driving that chisel through until we get them set. And you can see, even with my pre work, how much effort it takes. And there it goes. Wow. Obviously, that metal is quite hot, so you <laughs> you don't want to pick that up with your hands. If you had to guess, how hot would you say that say metal that is? Metal right now is about 14, 1,500 degrees. 1,400 degrees? Oh my goodness, yes. That's why he has those special gloves on, using those tools, making sure that we're all keeping safe. So with your tools, are those tools that you buy or the tools uh, you hand make? So this pair of tongs here was bought. Uh, it was manufactured by a company and purchased exactly how it is. Um, but these two sets of tongs here, I made. Cool. And then I made them with specific jobs in mind. So each of the jaws are shaped a little bit differently and they all lend themselves to doing a little bit different job for you. If you're working with round material, 
if, can can they see inside of that jaw? From I there? I can bring it over so we can so see, you see it. Yeah, that, you see that groove that's in there. That groove is so that when you pick up things like this, it will lock into that groove and it still gives you a tight grip yes. on a piece of round material. That is so, so cool. It makes them more multifunctional. Okay, let's get this hot and get this start to bend. There you go. Gonna... Fire that up. Probably like the most exciting thing is watching that fire go. So for those of you who have not been to Petaluma before, uh, the Petaluma Adobe, this is actually the rancho of General Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. It was his first land grant he received from the Mexican government. It totaled 66,000 acres at one time. This was a huge a cattle ranch. And it also, they would have needed blacksmith here because there's a lot of doors and windows. So things like Doug's making today, these hinges, would have been important for all those doors. What I'm doing right now is I'm just starting to get us round. Um, and one of the things when you chisel cut is you see all these sharp edges. Uh huh. So that's one of the parts that you need to do. I think we need to skip this other pair of tongs. Just a little tight. So one of the things that I will want to do is kind of throw those up and tap that back out because it's got to slide. You see, this is called the fuller of the hammer and it's often used to get into little tighter corners. So we can get in here and hit these areas whereas uh -huh. the big hammer is harder to get right up against that edge. Big into the hammer. That makes sense. Ooh, so now we've got it curled up. That's, there we go. And then get that fire going again. Now he's gonna bang it out some more. What I'm doing here by hitting it and lifting up, I'm actually causing the metal to roll. If I were just to hit it in one spot, I'd fold it over and then it would be too small to fit the pin. So what I'm trying to do is get the whole piece of metal to roll over fairly evenly mm -hmm. so that when I put the pin in there, I can tighten it up without pinching the pin and it will still swivel. Gonna roll it up like a cannoli. <laughs> so a lot of this is you got to heat it up, work heat it, it, heat it back again. A lot of this too is knowing how hot the metal needs to be and also knowing um, how far back you want to get it heated because if you want it to bend in a certain spot and you don't have it heated enough or far enough back, it will bend more before that spot. So there's a lot of, a lot of practice in knowing how much to do it and where. You guys want to see this fan he has going. Here it is. I noticed that I wanted to make sure I'd done was I want this real close to bent down a little more. Okay. That hadn't happened, so I was making sure that I got it hot all the way back to the shoulder so that I can have that be a little bit of an angle there too. Now we'll go back to it. Am 
my whole goal is to try and keep this as round as possible as I go. And there's some other methods we could use if I find that it's not quite as round as I need it. Gotcha. This purpose, what we're doing here should work just fine. This point in the game, I'm mm -hmm. actually gonna, gonna pretty close to wanting to get the piece of steel in there because I don't want to make a mistake <laughs> and get it too tight. So you're sizing it basically. That's exactly what we're doing with that. We're, we're sizing it to that pin. And it bounces around a little bit. You gotta sometimes you gotta readjust your hand on your tong because that's the hard part. This is very, very, very hot. If I actually touch my leather glove against that, you'll see a little smoke come off of it. And it's wrapping right around there. If you notice I, I keep moving the angle of my metal. Um, and so that allows me to, when I see it's egged a little bit, I'm going to come in and I'm going to drive it towards that egg and make it a little more round. There and you this go. pin, you can see how it's already kind of tightening up. That's what you have. The holes in your amble are for things just <laughs> like that. <laughs> to plop it right out. I like that. It's kind of important to remember which way the blower turns. Because if you go backwards, you draw on air instead of pushing it. So as we're watching today, so Doug is making one hinge. There are approximately 15 doors on this Adobe. So imagine in the 1800s having to make 30 hinges. You know, they don't have Home Depot guys. So this is really an art unto itself to have to have all these made by hand. Sometimes if you're not getting the right angle, you can also come in from the back. And a lot of it is just figuring out which direction you need the metal to move. And when you get to a certain point and things aren't moving. Do you heat them back up? You drive that down into that point and you take a different tool. This is called a drift. And this is one that I made myself. And you set that drift on there. So you can come out here, you get a little more support on its own. Set that drift right on that pin. And shoot right back out. Oh yeah, please get the drift. <laughs> Which is nearly as hard as getting. Now, here's something that's interesting that you may not realize, but see the color 
Oh, yeah. So that is actually a temper color. And the various colors are different forms of softening a hard metal. Um, and so it takes about 400 degrees to get to that color. So just being in there, the time that it was heated this pin up to that temperature. So that like half is like a bluish silver and then the other half is a grayish tan silver. So that's the difference. You heat it up and it becomes that bluish silver. And for this, I can actually put it in your water. So we do have a water bucket here to cool things down. I can set it on my stump without burning my stump. <laughs> Catching my whole pot. So I'm going to leave this where it's at okay. because I've got, I've got the rod and the pin that can fit through there. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing. But this must be harder because now you have two. Now to you do. have two that you have to work at the same time. So there's a couple of rules of thought and it depends on how neat and how perfect you need the job to be. And one is you might bend one of these out of the way so that you can square up this inside edge. Okay. And that's often the way that you'll do it. Um, and then in a modern shop, you might use a grinder or something, a file. Um, old blacksmiths could have used a file, just put that in a vise, file that off, um, but you can do all the work with a hammer. And that's... There you go. Well, now earlier we were talking and we mentioned how you kind of got inspired as a kid, but as an adult, uh, there's a show which kind of inspired the tile dole for this today's demonstration, yeah. uh, Forged with Fire. So did that have any involvement in you starting up blacksmithing as an adult? Yes, it actually did. Um, I was watching an episode of Forged in Fire and I saw the guy taking his high carbon knife over to the water bucket and I said, oh, don't do that, that's bad. And then I heard the judge on Fortune Fire go, don't do that, that's bad. And I thought to myself, I might know something about this. And so I built a forge and my wife bought me an anvil for Christmas and I went to blacksmithing and now I'm a blacksmith. <laughs> that is great. Be a yeah. Does it make a difference which way you turn the crank for your yes, air? Yes, it does. If you turn the crank backwards, it draws air through the pool. Backwards is this way. So the fans are going this way, and it's actually pulling air through the forge, which doesn't help to heat your focus. And you have to make sure that you're cranking it in the direction that the fans are going this way, and it's pushing the wind out of the Okay. So the heat in. And um, today you're working right outside, but uh, there's probably a reason most blacksmiths are inside because they're working with fire and it's hot out. <laughs> Keep a little bit cooler. Yeah, and there's also another reason. Um, in the bright sunlight, even though that metal's hot, it looks gray. But when you get it into a shadow situation, um, you can actually see the colors of it much better. So I bent that out of the way in the hopes that I'll be able to get in here and clean that up and I'm going to have to do another piece. 
Go for it. And how I'm telling how I need to do another heat is how much effort it's taking me with the hammer to move the metal. And when the, when the metal isn't moving very easily, then I know it's not quite hot enough. And I'm going to add a little bit of cold this way. So I learned something from you this morning while we were getting prepared and you were telling us about um, that there's actually metals in the coal and sometimes you have to take out some of the coal because the metals start to bind. So they're called clinkers and these are them <laughs> and what they are is all the different elements that might be in the coal. There might be magnesium, there might be copper, there might be iron, there are a lot of elements that can be in the coal. And as the coal burns, they melt and they melt together. Well, a lot of these elements are metals, elements that we put into our metal to give it properties, specific properties, like being able to bend and spring. And so those little pieces can actually put elements into your metal that you may not want. So you have to keep taking those out of your fire. It's gonna smoke a little more. All right, we'll move back a little bit. Fine. Okay, I can actually see I got a little more color to it now. All I'm trying to do right there is just knock off those sharp edges off of those that hinge a little more room to move. Off and back and forth. So the difference, I guess, between the coal forge and the gas forge is you're constantly working with the fire, keeping the fire going. You got to crank it, you got to heat it, you got to, you'd normally, if I were set up in my shop, I'd have a big pile of coal around would just rake more in. You don't have to sit there and work with the fire. You put a metal in, it gets hot, you pull it out, you work it back in. But the coal forge is a, a whole different dynamic rhythm. It's almost like a dance. I think it just kind of evokes back to the old time blacksmiths too. So you really feel and understand what they did. It's, yeah, it's exactly what they did other than they had a billows instead of a hand crank, but it would be the exact same process. Not everything has to be modernized too much. <laughs> This tool being a coal forge is, as you can see, there's no power here. So I'm not dependent on SMUD or pg &E. <laughs> I can make this tool whether there's a rolling blackout or not. Exactly. You're prepared. You, you, will, you will be a survivalist. Let's 
So what I did was I flattened that back out so that I can start rolling my edges um, out near the tip. Okay. Because if I start rolling back here, I won't be able to curl that around. So you got to start out at the edge. And that's one of the things I mentioned earlier about having to know where you're starting from and what, what to heat first. Um, and when you first start out doing this stuff, you heat it wrong and you get try and bend it, it doesn't work. And every time that happens, you learn a little bit and you get a little bit better at it. You just keep going back and forth. Metal, metal doesn't just get hot quick. A lot of times it takes time for that heat to soak in through the thickness of the metal. Is that, what exactly is the metal that you're using today? So the metal that I'm using today is called mild steel. Um, most of your hardware stores carry it and they call it weldable steel. It has a very low carbon in it, um, which steel is iron, ferrous iron with carbon added to it. And uh, you get different properties out of the metal, the different elements and the different amounts of carbon you have in it. A steel like this might be 0.04% carbon, but that little bit of carbon is enough to make it not be iron anymore, but to turn it oh. into steel. Interesting. And mild steels, were, it's very easy. It's easy to weld with, it's easy to work with. The difference is, is it doesn't get hard. So over time it can bend and misshape but it will do the job for a very long time. Um, and then they have blacksmiths to straighten it out again. <laughs> so unlike like the tools like your uh, shovel and your poke, that's made out of what kind of metal? These are mild steel as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. These are mild steel. And I made these for this forge uh, just recently. So you do have to be, then be careful also with those because they will heat up as well when you're working. Yeah, as far as grabbing them with your hands sitting next to the hot fire, that, that is true. <laughs> but that you can heat them up and reheat them and they, the, the low carbon content allows you to be able to do that with metal multiple times without ruining it. But if you have a steel that has a lot of carbon in it, um, that's another story. <laughs> So you're going to let that. So when you're uh, making these and, you, and you're getting the pins, uh, what would be another aspect of it that needs to be done after you've shaped it for the pins? Oh, I put it down here. So um, this hinge is the same as that one. And that pin is the same pin. Can they see that? Pin? Yeah, there you go. And so you wind up heating this in, and I prefer to use a, a peen hammer. So this is a, called a ball peen hammer, and that's because this is a ball. And to peen is to smash the end over the top and make the outside edge larger than the whole rest of the shaft so that it won't fall out. Oh, okay. So that's what we'll be doing with the pin when we go, when we get it set, we get the hinge work in, then we'll peen, peen these over and then we'll drip the holes. So the pin, once it's in there, it's in there. It's in there, yeah, yeah, it's not coming out. <laughs> Let's see how that piece of metal is now. Oh, that's looking hot now. Yeah, that's looking hot. You can see. 
can see that it's kind of like an orangish red. That's about 1600 degrees. Oh, that's hot. That one, not quite as hot as the other one. You want to work them at both the same time. Getting that metal hot. Yeah. Look at that. See, now that side's hot too. Well, the, the temperature really has a huge effect on how the metal moves. And so, I'm, you see, I'm not using very much force on this particular part. And it's because I wanna, I wanna pay attention and I wanna watch that bend. I wanna make sure that I'm making that bend round. And if I were using a lot of force, I'd, I'd hit it and it would go too far one direction and then I'd have to straighten it up and come back. Um, that's why you, some, some parts you have to go really gentle. Some parts take a little more. <laughs> See how that looked like it bent? Yeah. That's because it has other elements in it. Ah. All right. So let's see, bend this out. So the metal wants to twist on you while you're trying to get them over and you have to come back and kind of coax it into its shape. And as you can see, because you've stretched flat metal into a curve, you're always gonna get these kind of rounded areas. I just wanna make sure you have the space to fit around the hands because if it doesn't, now is a good time to take care of it. We're yes. getting right on that point where um, it's important to make sure that the pieces fit together just like a puzzle. Oh, yeah. And as I dig down in here, you can see how, the, how there's that really hot bed of coals under there that I keep going back to. And that's what I'm doing here is shoving it down into that set of coals with some fresh over the top so that it all gets hot.
Doug's letting that heat up. Just so you guys know, you know, he makes more than just hinges because obviously he's worked on some of his own tools. And you see those knives on there? He actually made those knives um, out of Damas D Damascus steel. This, these two are stainless. Okay. And that one is Damascus. Damascus. So he has been practicing on more than just hinges. <laughs> Remember, I cooled that off. He's got his pen, it's cooled. I got two young boys, and they, they get to come out in the shop and they work with me. And I always tell them all the time don't pick any piece of metal up in this shop unless you test how hot it is. How do you test how hot it is? <laughs> you, uh, you, raise your, you raise your bare hand to it with the back of your hand and you come in closer and see if you feel any heat. Okay. Because if you touch it with the front of your hand, your natural instinct is to close and you might close your hand on a Ooh, really hot piece of metal. That's actually really good advice. Looks like a little. I already came off of there by your glove. Yeah, I uh, actually touched the edge of that with my glove. Just a little bit. As you guys can see, has lots of safety equipment, the gloves, the apron, glasses, make sure nothing gets in his eyes. And of course, we're always safety here. So we have lots of fire extinguishers. <laughs> Important things, especially working around old historic buildings. And of course, for the safety of our own people. It's just like turning. There. Yeah. Yeah, it started to tighten up right there. And part of it isn't quite where I want it to be. So I'm going to look for a way that I can use my amble to change that. So that's one thing that takes a long time to really learn is how you can use all the different parts of the anvil to aid in the job that you're doing. Um, and the longer you smith and the more you do this, the more you figure out all these little tips and tricks. Um, yeah, what I'd love to be able to do is that back a little more. So I got that one pinched a little tight which probably means that it was a little hotter right there on that crease, so it didn't roll quite as much. Okay. And, and we'll, we get our, we get ourselves out of that predicament. Actually, I'd like to get that pin out of there. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't melt the pin in with it. By bringing that back to there, I do have, I have the advantage of using the amble to help me hold my material down. Notice that I'm using my left hand? Yes. Because it was easier to use my left hand to get myself started than it was to try and refigure out how to hang on to the piece. So sometimes you have to be a little ambidextrous as well, which just means that you can use both hands at the same time. There it goes. It eventually is coming out. Yeah, we'll get it. Do a little something. That'd be my off time. <laughs> well, he gets to wait just a couple more good. minutes. <laughs> See, even our even our maintenance department, you always have to be prepared. You never know when someone might call. Well, we're almost up. We have a couple more minutes. Time flies. 
Absolutely. when we're doing these presentations. Yeah, and I, this, so this process to build a hinge from start to finish probably take three to four hours to wow. do the whole entire process by yourself. Three to four hours just to build a hinge. So we've been going for 44 minutes and we just have almost the initial parts of the hinge done. The rounding of the edges to fit the pin in. So after your edges are rounded, then you get your pin in and then what else would you have to do? So what else you might have to do is on a hinge like this, you have an angle here or it doesn't open all the way flat and the door won't open all the way out or close all the way. So you have to eat these edges back at an angle so that they will fit together when it's flat. Then you have to take your ball peen hammer and peen the tip of your pin over and smash it so that it's bigger than your hinge so that it won't come out. And when you're done with that, you have to go back and heat the whole piece up and you take your punch and you just keep hitting it in the same spot until you squish that down to almost nothing. And then you flip it over and you'll see a little dark spot right there and you hit it from the other side and you punch a hole right through that hot metal with But that, grip. and then you can screw it onto your door. And then you can screw it onto your door. Oh, well, we thank you so much, Doug, for demonstrating us today, uh, blacksmithing. Um, you are quite our accomplished uh, person here. You just know almost everything how to do, which is great for the Sonoma uh, State Parks around here that were historic. We have someone who can actually recreate some of those historic elements to keep our parks looking authentic. So I thank you for giving us your time today. And if you guys are, you know, you enjoy these programs, just want to remind you guys that these webinars are put on by the Parks um, Online Resources for Teachers and Students, Ports. So if you go to the Ports website, you can find some more of these great programs to watch in the future. So thank you everyone for coming today and hopefully we'll see you in the future. Bye. Bye.